Hi everyone, I'm Jean and welcome to another program presented to you by the Pamunkey Regional Library. As you can see, I'm not at the Rockville branch today. I am instead at Montpelier Park here in Montpelier, Virginia. And today we are going to be following a bluebird trail. I have a wonderful guest speaker today. Her name is Terry Atkinson and she is a certified master naturalist and a member of our local riverine branch. Today, Terry is going to share with us one of her projects with the Master Naturalist, which is monitoring the Bluebird Trail here at Montpelier Park. So now I'm gonna introduce you to our guest speaker, Terry Atkinson. Hey, welcome Terry. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank Good. you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Um, how long has the Bluebird Trail been here at Montpelier Park? This is our fifth year, believe it or not. Um, so in order to establish this trail, we had to get permission from Hanover Parks and Rec and spec out where all the houses were going to go, actually build the houses and install them the fall before we opened the trail. So I guess you could say that November is when we officially started. Wonderful. And what makes this a official bluebird trail? Well, um, you have to have at least five boxes to be an official trail. You have to have it be monitored on a regular basis and maintained on a regular basis. You have to be on public lands. It has to have the permission um, that's required from the public entity, in this case, Hanover County. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to monitor and record the data. And that's the most important part, is making sure that you're keeping track of the number of nests, the number of eggs, the number of fledglings. And you want to do that consistently throughout the season. And that's reported to both the Bluebird Society and also the Cornell Lab. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Where do you, what do you actually do with this data once you collect it? So that's wonderful. And I'm, you know, I'm um, just one of zillions of bluebird trails across the country. This is a nationwide effort. The bluebird is native to North America. And we have the eastern bluebird here. There are also western and mountain bluebirds, which we don't have. Um, but its number was declining for so many years and it actually became endangered and so that's how this whole bluebird trail started nationwide and that you will find them everywhere we have several in hanover county up at poor farm park we have one at pole green you'll see them um, up in ashland at the pupper belly park okay. i think it's called mm -hmm. and the community garden center up there the ymca so it these trails are all around you. You just have to notice. And are they all monitored by Virginia Master Naturalists? No, some of them actually are monitored by members of the Virginia Bluebird Society. So we are just one cog in the wheel. So you actually also have, I think, some that are monitored by just individuals and they report into the Bluebird Society. There are a lot of people that are passionate about bluebirds and I now consider myself one of them. Wonderful. So um, Terry is now going to let us, allow us to follow her around to see what she actually does when she's monitoring the Bluebird Trail. Yeah, come along. Okay, so with five boxes on this trail, one of the things you want to do with the Bluebird House is make sure it's a certain number of feet away. So we could have actually done about six or seven here, but we decided on five because we wanted this park to be successful and then we can add boxes maybe later. Later. Mm -hmm. So this first one is right over here. So mm -hmm. I want to show you this one. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to open this box or really fortunately because we have a mama bluebird in there. I saw her earlier, yeah. And she's feeding her young, but those babies are over 14 days old. So between like once they turn around 14, we do not open the boxes. And that's because we're trying to make sure they don't prematurely leave the nest. Mm -hmm. We call it fledging. Um, if they fledge early, 
a predator may get them because they're not able to fly that well yet and we don't want to startle those babies into leaving the nest right so the first one we're not going to open but at least i can show you the box and tell you a little bit about it okay and this is the first box and as i mentioned these babies are older now so we're not going to be opening it mm -hmm. but we can get a little bit closer what you can see from this is the boxes are pretty specific in their makeup so this is what's called a Carl Little design. And after years of doing this, there's a lot of research about the best way to attract bluebirds and also to make sure that a predator won't get in the nest. So you see we have a knoll guard is what it's called that we've installed on that box. And that keeps out snakes, raccoons, possums. You want to keep your box away from overhanging limbs if you can because snakes will drop down and try to get to the babies. Mm. You also have this um, baffle on there for the same reason. You're trying to make sure that there are no predators that get in that. The holes have to be the right size. You don't want a hole that's too big because then you can get a predator in there. The knoll guard helps with that too and there are predator birds for these bluebirds. So the reason the hole is important is you don't really want to attract, if you can, a starling. Hmm. So you're trying to keep starlings out. And as you can see on the side of this box, I don't know if you may want to show you on another one, but it clearly marks that it's against uh, federal law and state law for anybody other than a certified person to open this box. And that's important because, believe it or not, one of our predators is humans. So if uh, someone that didn't know what they were doing opened this box right now, they would not know that maybe they're putting these little babies at risk. And there are five of them in there now. Aww. Mom has been busy eating all day. Mm -hmm. So let's walk to the next one. Okay. Two on our trail. One of the neat things about having a trail is the extra exercise you get. <laughs> it's beautiful out here. It is gorgeous. And I love the setting for this particular box mm -hmm. because it's just off into the woods. Mm -hmm. It just feels so natural. You'd never know you were on a track. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is box number two, which we are going to open today. Ooh if I can find my screwdriver. There it is. How often do you have to monitor, do this, Terry, do this um, monitoring? Well, it's really interesting. Cornell would prefer that you do it once a week, um, but the Bluebird uh, Society prefers that you do it twice a week. Okay. So we go with twice a week, and I have a fellow monitor that I've volunteered for this trail who I do her working with, and it's nice to have a second person because you can verify what you're seeing with someone else. You wanna make sure there's like three days apart uh, before you come back. Okay. Um, bluebirds have no sense of human smell, which is really interesting, because I thought at first that you'd have to wear gloves and be careful, mm -hmm. but actually they don't care about that. They kind of like humans. Hmm. And humans should like them, because bluebirds eat a whole lot of Pests, insects. especially for farmers. They're insect-loving birds. Mm -hmm. They don't actually eat many seeds. People will put up seed feeders and mm -hmm. think that they're going to attract bluebirds. And you may get some that are kind of interested in the sunflower seeds because they're very curious birds and just want to check it out. But they really like mealworms if you're going to put up something to attract them. But just having good natives in your backyard or if you're a farmer, I mean, they love cutworms and they love grasshoppers and they love all kinds of things that are gonna eat your crops. So they're really a great bird to have around because they love to eat insects. They're an asset, yes. They are an asset. Okay, opening this box. It's very technical <laughs> opening using the screwdriver. Okay, and you're just opening the side up. 
Yeah, open the side and you have to be a little bit careful. You don't want to tap the box before, but you could have a mom in here. Mm -hmm. So you try to make as much Because you don't know what you're going to see when you open it up every time, right? No, you okay. don't. And uh, we also attract a lot of wasps here in this park. And so you're constantly cleaning wasps out of these traps. Mm -hmm. So, and as someone who's highly allergic, I always worry about this. Oh, oh, oh. That was the mom. <laughs> Wasn't that cool? So you're looking at this going, well, that didn't look like a bluebird. And it wasn't. That was a oh. chickadee mom. Oh. So this is a chickadee nest. And you notice how gorgeous that is? Look at the moss. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? And yeah. then they do these feathers over their eggs, which is so cool. Very now, neat. why do we leave this chickadee nest in here? Well, the fact is chickadees are great birds too, and they're native cavity nesters. So if we get a native bird that's a cavity nester, we leave the nest leave and alone. we report that too. Mm -hmm. And chickadees get along very well. Now, one of the things, again, I'm monitoring, so I'm gonna put my camera in here. Mm -hmm. I turned the sound off, so, but I want to just see what I get. <gasps> mm. What'd you get? Babies. <gasps> Look at that. We have baby chickadees. All right, let's see. Can I go out. in there? Yeah, I think so. If you just turn your phone in there. There you oh go. Oh my goodness. Look at them. Isn't that incredible? They're moving around. Yeah. All right, so we're going to close this box up. And now that we know there are chickadee babies in there, mm -hmm. we're probably not going to check this box until after they fledge. Okay. Let them be. Let them be. Because we're not doing a lot of the research on the chickadees. Mm -hmm. We just want to be sure that they stay. Aww. Okay, so let's go on to box number three. three. So here we are at box number three. And you can see that humans aren't much of a problem, right? Look how close this field house is. Look how close we are to where kids play all the time, right? And we have games. Mm -hmm. so. so it doesn't keep the birds away. No, it doesn't keep the birds away at all. Okay, box number three. <laughs> Again, we're making as much noise as possible. Although we didn't startle that mother out of the last box until you opened it. I know, and that always happens. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they say to make all the noise, but I do it. Okay, so she's doing the same thing. She's opening the side up again. Right. The process is pretty much the same. Oh, and there goes another mom. <laughs> now, sometimes bluebird moms get so upset with you that they'll actually fly at your head. Yeah. Well, I heard, um, I've always heard that bluebirds are very, um, what's the word, protective of their young. They're pretty protective. Um, I mean, you know, mom will get up in a tree and squawk at me when mm -hmm. I approach a box. Mm -hmm. If I scare her, she'll fly at my head. Well, that's all uh, moms should. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Did you get anything? Uh, let's see. Ooh, look at that. We've Ooh, got eggs. eggs in this one. Now, okay. these eggs are speckled. See mm -hmm. how they're speckled? Mm -hmm. Well, go on in there and get a picture. Hopefully I'm getting these. So we knew as soon as we opened this box, mm -hmm. look, there's another chickadee nest. Right, you right? can see all it looks exactly moss, the same, right? All those flat, um, feathers in there mm -hmm. lining it, mm -hmm. the softness of it, mm -hmm. that's chickadees. Okay. And you can hear them screaming. Okay. So let's... So the chickadee eggs are kind of tannish with speckles. Correct. So when you get a bluebird egg, bluebird eggs are, and I'll show you the nest um, in a box that we can open, but the nests are totally different looking and the eggs are totally different. So they're no speckled egg. Okay. For the most part, they're blue. Who would have guessed? Mm -hmm. um, but occasionally in about four or five percent of nesters that are bluebirds, you'll get white eggs. 
and they can be ranging from a deep dark blue to that very white and sometimes for a young bluebird you'll notice that you get a blue egg but it's got some like white marks in it kind of streaks or mm -hmm. and Striated. people often think those are cracks mm -hmm. but they're not okay. that's just normal in a less mature bluebird mom okay so this one will continue to open until those baby chickadees hatch okay now terry you said that um that um are there other birds that you would leave nest if as long as they're um there are a few. Um, in this particular trail, we've only had chickadees use okay. them. Okay. But you would have to like check and make sure in your area mm -hmm. what you have as a native cavity nester. Gotcha. And you're not gonna get with this size hole, you're not gonna get some cavity nesters like woodpeckers They'd be too or large, wood right. ducks or any of those kinds of things. Okay. Now occasionally you'll get a wren in there. Mm -hmm. And we leave the wrens. House wrens are not great for bluebirds because mm -hmm. they're very territorial but they're still native okay. so we do leave them now what happens if you find a bird where you, you um, don't want it in there would you just remove the nest um, we would just remove the nest and um, there is one house here um, bird house that is not one of ours that is run by the garden club and occasionally we have had an invasive bird in there I mean, one of the reasons for bluebird declines was frankly starlings and house sparrows, mm -hmm. which are not native to this area. They were brought over by Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, but now they've pretty much taken over a lot of the cavities. Oh, but let's get away from the screaming yeah. chickadee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to get back inside. <laughs> she does, and she's very irritated with us right now. Box four. This is a box we've actually had a lot of trouble with. In one of our seasons early on, someone opened the box mm. and definitely human because you know, birds don't have, have screwdrivers. <laughs> the ability to do this. And um, unfortunately what they did is they removed the nest and threw it on the ground. And I was able, it must have happened like right before I came because I was able to save two of the birds, put the nest back and put two of the fledglings in, but the other three babies were dead. And that's why it's so important that people that aren't trained in this don't open boxes because they may get started. Okay, so here we are at box four. And we're really excited this year because despite the accreditation of humans earlier in the season, we actually have a nest Yay! I know, it's exciting. Because for two years, it went without any activity whatsoever. So we were really worried about this one and actually thought about moving it. Hmm. Um, ah, oops, and a wasp. Here is the bane of my existence. <laughs> Up here at Montpelier, for whatever reason, we have a very active wasp colony. And so we get these wasps all the time in here, mm -hmm. and you have to dissuade them. So we start at the beginning of the season dissuading them by taking a bar of ivory soap and rubbing it along all the wooden parts hmm. of the box mm -hmm. because it's harder for the wasps to attach once okay. you do this. Unfortunately, this wasp is very persistent. So, are you allergic? You might want to say No, but back. I shall step back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, well, let's see if we have eggs first before we do that. So, you can see how a bluebird nest is different. See? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is mostly pine. The nest itself is cup-shaped almost. Mm -hmm. So when you go in to look at it, which we can do after we remove the wasps, mm -hmm. but I'm checking to make sure if we have eggs yet or not, that might make him move. No eggs. Okay. So safe to remove the wasp. I would anyway, if mm -hmm. there were eggs, mm -hmm. but I might do it a little less happily. Okay, well that didn't exactly remove him, but it did get the nest off. 
All right, now we're gonna rub some soap on and hope that he doesn't nest back. Okay. So and it's basically that they can't grip on as easily. It's not the scent of the soap or anything. No. And the other thing is, remember I told you bluebirds didn't have much of a sense of smell? Mm -hmm. They could care that we have ivory soap. Okay. Gotcha. So we have a nest in there. That's good news. Mm -hmm. Now, if this nest doesn't attract eggs, mm -hmm. you know, some nests get abandoned. Mm -hmm. And you can see that this one might be because there are spider webs here, which will also clean out. Mm -hmm. But early in the season like this, we tend to leave it. Um, with the idea that it might have been a mom that because of a cold snap mm -hmm. or because for whatever reason she scouted a place she liked better um abandoned gave up on the nest gave up on this particular mm -hmm. one now bluebirds will nest on top of existing nests but we tend to clean them out every time and we do that for a couple of reasons one is um they won't just lay their eggs in the existing nest. They build a new nest on top of it and then lay their eggs. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, that increases the width. Mm -hmm. A predator will find it easier to reach the eggs if they're at this height rather than down God, here, right? Makes sense, yeah. So that's one. The other thing is um, vermin. So blowflies will get in here or um, other kinds of parasites and in order to keep that from happening, we just remove the nest after the babies have fledged. Make sure it's all clean and clean, I mean, cleaned out of materials. Make sure we do the ivory soap again to make sure there are no wasps. And just kind of, and it doesn't discourage that mom at all, because remember, she's gonna build a new nest anyway. But now we've got a clean box. We don't have any problem with the parasites. Um, because if you leave it, you'll get those. And you also get ants out here that will climb a pole, right, and come in. And mm -hmm. those can also eat babies, you know, if you get enough of them. So anyway, we don't like to leave that because that scent and all the mess mm -hmm. from the growing babies might attract those parasites. So let me just understand, Terry. So do you do that after every fledge or do you do that at the end of the season? After every fledge. Okay. So that's another reason to have somebody that knows what they're doing mm -hmm. out here doing it because mm -hmm. you got to know when they fledged. So you got to have the data on that and know that they're out of the box before you open it and before you clean it out. Okay. And then, you know, bluebirds will do at least two nests, sometimes three. I've actually had in the next box we're going to a bluebird do four nests in a season. Wow. So the How season, long does it take for them to build one nest, you typically? They can do it really quick. I've seen them go up, it's typically a week, seven days or so, mm -hmm. but I've seen them go up in two days. Wow. If that mom is anxious and really is ready, mm -hmm. um, they can build it as fast as two days. Because remember, dad's helping on the nest building mm -hmm. and he's helping on the feeding. Um, so it can go really quick, but more likely to be a week, but early in the season like this, I'd say let them go two or three weeks okay. just to see. I mean, we're getting kind of close now, so this may be one I remove. We have special permits that allow us to remove nests, and I brought some along today just in case anybody asked me, although nobody ever has. <laughs> um, and we can salvage these nests for display purposes and for our educational opportunities that we give the community. Mm -hmm. So. Um, when some of our old nests get not in great shape because the public has, I mean, we've hauled them out and put them on display tables and that kind of thing, I may salvage this one and use it for our educational display. And then if I don't, I just take it out, I wrap it in a, a paper bag and I dispose of it that way. You can put it just in here, the edge of the woods, just mm -hmm. make sure you know, you've separated the material a little bit. And, um, but it's, it's going. All so right. I'm hopeful this okay. year. We got a nest. Now we're on to box five. Mm -hmm. Box five is my favorite box. And you'll see when we get there, it's in a really odd place in a way, cause it's right by the road. Mm. Bluebirds don't care. So the reason I love box five is it's the first place we had bluebirds out here in the park. So it's our favorite box. It's still our most productive box. This is the one, like I said, that we got four. 
nest in one season, and we typically do. This box is loved by the bluebirds. Let's go see what we got. So on this one, we have had to cut back overhanging the limbs a little bit. And actually the park um, staff has been great. They were out here and I asked them to cut it back and they did. They nice. did a great job. We also had poison ivy out here and they cleared a little bit of that for me too, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. That's another thing on trails, it's a hazard. Wasp, poison ivy. Mm -hmm. So here we go on box five. Process is the same. We're opening the box. Well, we might need to put our glasses on for that. Who made all these boxes for you, Terry? Actually, I did. Really? Along with a fellow master naturalist and her husband. Wow. So my part <laughs> was the painting part. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to paint the inside of a box ever, mm -hmm. but the outside, we we paint to protect them mm -hmm. and so that they'll hold up and these like i said have been here five seasons and they are still in really good yeah, shape yeah they look great um <laughs> the tags probably need to be replaced before the boxes mm -hmm. um, he built this part although um then we attached them uh, her husband mm -hmm. and um, I did help a little bit on some of the boxes themselves uh, but yeah it's and if you want to build a box there are blueprints for it on the Virginia Bluebird Society website and just look for the Carl Little uh, blueprints mm -hmm. and you can build your own because this is something you could put on your your own property oh yeah. yeah we encourage people to do that not everything has to be a bluebird trail mm -hmm. so you will enjoy them in your own backyard all right so i hear a little bit of rustling let's see if there's a mama in there no okay nothing flying out like the other ones but you can see the nest again is a bluebird nest yep and it's you're getting good at this you're going to be a master <laughs> you're teaching me no okay so go ahead and put your camera over there okay what do you see i'm gonna do mine too i didn't take a picture so i couldn't see okay. what, what's in there babies <gasps> babies so these babies i actually kind of knew this before we came today <laughs> these babies are still young enough that we're checking and i think i might have given you the wrong number earlier we don't we don't uh we stop at about 13 14 days for okay. fledging it's okay. 17 days when they on the front cycle when they fledge okay so just to be clear a bluebird will lay its eggs and here we've usually gotten five eggs they can lay as many as six or as few as four okay. so four to six eggs they do one every day and they do them in the morning hmm. so you know how because you're monitoring twice a week mm -hmm. you know exactly how long the last day is of the last egg a bluebird doesn't um, incubate its eggs until the last one is laid interesting yeah so they're all the same age when they hatch out they're the same age okay. and that's how you know you can wait those 14 days okay um so we this one now we will not just like the first box we're not going to check this one again because these babies are now old enough that we don't want to, to have them, them fledge prematurely right I need my screwdriver. It's good to have lots of pockets as a master <laughs> naturalist because you're constantly dipping things. Carrying, carrying things. Carrying things. But you want to be sure when you leave these boxes that they're very secure. So you may, you may have said it already, Terry, and forgive me if you have. Um, how many eggs do they typically lay? 
It's between four to six. Four to six, okay. So, and okay. they can range from that pale blue color to... to the white color. Okay. Or to blue with white through them. Right. Um, but it's more typical, like, especially this box. We know this is a mature bluebird. Mm -hmm. All those eggs are deep blue. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a bird that's been coming back to the same house. And that's the other thing to remember is, you know, when we started off this trail, we had very little productivity the first year right mm -hmm. we only had two nests off season in this box and we had like one nest somewhere else mm -hmm. the next year it grew um this is our fifth year all the boxes are full right so they come back they come back to the area that they know and that's one of the neat things about this trail is i see birds that were fledglings here three years ago or mm -hmm. four years ago and they're back. So Terry, um, how long does a typical um, eastern bluebird live? Bluebirds can live from six to ten years. Okay. I know one of the bluebirds out here I'm pretty sure I've seen for four years in a row. So someone in this box who's been yelling at us intermittently <laughs> because she is now very upset with us. <laughs> okay, so that is our bluebird trail, all five boxes. Like I said, after these babies successfully fledge, we'll remove the nest, make sure that they all lived. Unfortunately, we do have to check to see if there are any dead birds in the nest or any unhatched eggs. So it could be that the mom laid five, but only four were viable. Sometimes if that happens, the bluebird will remove that egg from the nest and you'll find it on the ground. Don't worry if that happens. Other times it's just because the egg wasn't viable. Um, and then the same thing will sometimes happen with the young. If a bluebird knows that one of the babies is not a viable baby, she will sometimes push it out of the nest and feed the others. They want to conserve their resources and mm -hmm. make sure they feed the living birds right. and the babies that are going to thrive. Right. And we like that because they come back and build nests Absolutely. the next season. Yeah. And the other thing I should tell you too is um, they usually start in about mid-March, the bluebirds mm -hmm. on this trail. Um, and then they'll go through, they don't like heat. So by the end of the July, they're done. They're done. Sometimes even by mid-July, mm -hmm. their season is over. And then we do winterize these boxes in order to encourage the birds to overwinter here. So what that entails is, you know, we cleaned out the nest, but what we'll do is we'll put a little bit of pine needle on the bottom and we turn the nest against the prevailing winds. So you'll notice all these nests are turned a certain way. It's to protect them from wind and rain. Hmm. Bluebirds don't want their babies to be cold or wet, sure. neither do we. Right. Um, so, you know, we try to turn it so, and the prevailing winds change seasonally, of course. So we turn it so that in the winter, they can come in and overwinter if they want. We used to close them up uh, to discourage the house sparrows from coming in because they tend to come in earlier. But we found that the house sparrows um, really don't seem to come in earlier. This year, they came in later than the bluebirds. And we've noticed over the five years that the bluebird season has started earlier and earlier. We don't really know what to attribute that to. It could be that these are returning birds and they know where to come. It could be that it's getting a little bit warmer in, earlier in the season. We're unsure what's that, um, what that is, but from the first year we did to the fifth year, we've started monitoring two weeks earlier than we did the first year. There's some on the fence right now. That looks like a male and a female, right, Terry? Yeah. Terry, that was so much fun. I feel like I learned so much. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge of bluebirds and letting us follow you around today. Well, that's great, Jean. Thank you for having me again. And if I've inspired any passion in you all for learning more about bluebirds, please go to the Virginia Bluebird Society website. We'll have that at the end of this program. Um, so check it out, see if you might like to learn more about bluebirds. And if you'd like to become a Virginia Master Naturalist or just learn more about Master Naturalists, 
please go to that website as well and we'll have that link for you too. Thank you again. It has been a pleasure. Thanks, Terry, and I hope everybody enjoyed this program. Bye-bye.